Boston is home to me. It's my heart, my history, and of course, as I'm frequently reminded, my accent. I was born in a tenement. The bathroom was not in our apartment, but down the hall. That stays with you. During the summers, I worked for my father. From his success selling linoleum, he'd gotten into the restaurant business. My father also owned two drive-in theaters. Very early in drive-in history, he bought a piece of land in Valley Stream on Long Island and built the first drive-in in New York. I worked one summer selling hot dogs at the refreshment stand at the Sunrise Drive-In. This was my introduction to the high-powered world of media and entertainment. My passion for learning was instilled in me by my mother, Belle. Her proudest moment was the day I graduated from Boston Latin School with the highest grade point average in the history of the school. Why did I choose the law? Because it symbolizes two ideals I hold dear to this day, reason and justice. Content is king, but I must tell you that the kingdom is under fire. The very technologies that allow us to sell more content over more platforms all over the world enable infringers to steal what we create over more platforms all over the world. Let me state the obvious. Copyright is right, inherently right, for both the creator and the consumer. I taught at BU Law School through much of the 1980s, and I'm proud to say that my daughter, Shari, is a BU Law School graduate. So my association with the university and the city for which it is named is both long and deep. This school is where two of my enduring passions meet. They are education and the law. The study that takes place within this school's walls is enormous. It's my hope that this beautiful building and I must say it's got a pretty good name, will serve students for many years to come. Well, good afternoon. I'm Maureen O'Rourke, the Dean of the Law School, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the new Boston University School of Law. And at the outset, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the members of the Board of Trustees in attendance, as well as our former law school deans, Colin Diver and Bill Schwartz. Welcome back. And really, thank you all so much for coming today to celebrate the official opening of the Sumner M. Redstone Building. Mr. Redstone's support speaks volumes to me for two reasons. First, that someone who is not a graduate of BU would be so generous brings home, I think, in a particularly poignant way that what we do here is important to our university, to our city, to our country, and given our global footprint, the world. Second, that Mr. Redstone, a savvy businessman and who has apparently strong opinions about copyright law, um, <laughs> would put his support behind us at a time of great challenge to legal education is a tremendous vote of confidence, and we have no intention of letting him down. My job today is a lot easier and happier than usual. It really is just to say thank you. It's made more difficult because there are too many people to thank than is possible in my limited time. So apologies in advance, because inevitably I will leave someone out. First and foremost, of course, we are enormously grateful for the generous support of our alumni and friends whose names you will see on spaces throughout the building and to the development office at the law school and the university for all of its work. I do hope that you'll walk through the building on your own or take one of our tours to see the facility and that you will also review your programs to see the names of the many others who have named spaces in the tower. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't note that there are many spaces in both Redstone and the tower still available for naming. <laughs> there are also many people whose names will never appear on any published list, but whose incredibly hard work played a major role in getting us here today. And it, that work continues as we work to complete the project. So please bear with me as I thank some of these people. 
Thank you to the business and academic sides of the university, especially to our former Executive Vice President, Joe Mercurio, and to our current Senior Vice President for Operations, Gary Nixa, our CFO, Marty Howard, former Provost David Campbell, and current Provost Gene Morrison, and all of their staffs for their dedication to getting this done. Thank you to the group that we affectionately call the Abutters. Mugar Library, Metropolitan College, the School of Theology, Marsh Chapel, and the College of Arts and Sciences, led respectively by Bob Hudson and Deans Tanya Zlotova, Mary Elizabeth Moore, Bob Hill, and Gina Sapiro. They have been uniformly gracious in enduring the disruption associated with a project that will not benefit them directly, so thank you. To our architects and the entire team at Bruner Cott, led by Lee Cott and project leads Lynn Brooks and Peter Ziegler. I thought I could sum it up if I read you part of an email that I sent to Lee. I can't thank you enough for the work you've done on the new building. It is just beautiful. All of those details that you focused on and all of the care that you took on everything, like the views and the flow and the lines and the finishes made such a difference. It is a showpiece, dignified, clean, light, airy, what a difference from what we had. It's inspiring, bravo, and thank you. To our project manager, Nancy Joyce, for her leadership in getting us to this day. And of course, to the construction team from both Skanska and BU. When you're outside, take a look at how close this building is to Mugar Library and the School of Theology. And of course, it also connects to the tower already in some places. And we've had to keep the school running while this work has gone on. At the same time, we've had to move an entire law school to various locations across campus. I actually don't think it's possible to overstate the complexity associated with this project, both in terms of construction and the logistical challenges associated with relocation. It hasn't always been perfect, but not for one minute have I ever had any reason to question your good faith or commitment to working with us to do the very best we could for our students. So a tremendous thank you to the Skanska construction team Mark Tarian, Mike Culler, and Darren Bell, you have run an outstanding job site, and your standards have inspired the subcontractors. You can see the pride with which the work was done throughout this building, and that is a real tribute to you. And thank you to the rest of the team, particularly Kevin Dunn from BU and Brian Kelly from Compass. If there is a misspelling on a sign, or a non-working clock, or I want to know why we have shoeshine benches outside, or why we have ramps to nowhere, <laughs> or why the hand dryers take so long, or why it's so cold. It's usually Kevin who hears about it. Thank you for your patience and your determination to get to things before I even hear about them. To the team at the law school, particularly Assistant Dean Liz Serrato, Facilities Manager Linda Skinner, and our librarian Marlene Alderman. They have all done double duty. Their full-time jobs, in addition to working on this project for way too long, for too little recognition, to too many complaints, and too few thank yous. To the faculty, especially those on the building committee and our associate dean, David Walker, and to our staff for putting the students first. That's clearly the right thing to do, but not all faculties would, in fact, put them first. And I hope you remember that you've made a tremendous positive difference to our students when it gets cold and snowy and you're walking here from 910. <laughs> Thank you to our alumni. We heard you about the building. In fact, we lived through it with you. And it took a little while, but I hope you'll agree that when everything we needed finally came together, we did it right. To Michael Charlanti, Christine Wynn, Kate Braun, and their staffs, and our own staff, for planning not one, but two groundbreaking ceremonies, and this one as well. And finally, and most especially to our students, especially our 2Ls and 3Ls who have never known anything but construction, and to anyone here today from the class of 2014, for your patience and your grace. We have tried our best and will continue to do so to minimize disruption, but nothing in life is perfect, and sometimes things go wrong, and sometimes they go wrong at the worst possible moments. So I apologize for the times we did not get it right despite our best efforts, and I hope that all of this makes up for some part of that. This is a law school dedication, so it seemed perfectly appropriate for me to quote a Supreme Court justice, Felix Frankfurter, who once said, 
Gratitude is one of the least articulate of the emotions, especially when it is deep. And I think I have probably proven that statement today. My gratitude is indeed too profoundly deep to find the right words to articulate it. All I can say is thank you. Thank you all. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. As I said to her when I called her to invite her today, I could not imagine having this event without her. She is our highest ranking member of the judiciary, one of three of the six justices on the First Circuit Court of Appeals that are BU Law alumni. As she pointed out to me earlier, Harvard is in the minority there. She is an embodiment of the spirit of BU Law, an institution with a historic commitment to openness. On her graduation, she was the first female law clerk in the history of the Rhode Island Federal Courts. She served the public as an assistant attorney general and as the general counsel of the Mass Department of Education. She represented, it, represented the state of Massachusetts in the Boston school desegregation cases. She went into private practice and became the first woman chair of the litigation department of her firm, Foley Hoag. She was the first woman appointed to the First Circuit and in 2008 became its first female judge. She is a past president of the BBA as well. I could go on. Her career obviously demonstrates that she possesses a formidable intellect. What's not obvious from reading the dry facts is that she is also a person of sterling integrity, passionate about and committed to the rule of law. We are proud to call her an alum and to invite her to speak today. Please welcome Judge Sandra Lynch. It's wonderful to be invited to speak at a joyous celebration of a beautiful new building. And I have to tell you, my colleague Juan Torreya and his wife Judy Torreya, part of the BU force on the First Circuit, is here with us today. You know, I was a law student here between 1968 and 1971, and my classes were in what was then called the New Law Tower. <laughs> I actually loved law school. My courses were exciting, stimulating. They dealt with real and important problems, and they were about helping people and helping our society. My professors, including the legendary Henry Monahan, were excellent, and they held us to high standards. You know, I'll admit the Socratic method was not often <clears throat> pleasant, but fear of failure proved to be a remarkable incentive to learn. BU Law is where I was taught to think like a lawyer. That means a great many things. It means having a questioning mind, the ability to frame the right questions, getting the facts right, a dispassionate ability to evaluate arguments on both sides, and above all, an understanding of the larger purposes underlying a legal rule or statute or doctrine. This school is where I learned to love the law. The law embodies a constant search for justice and fairness. It gives us an ability to make our society with all of its many conflicting interests work. And legal reasoning has beauty and elegance. We have the best legal system in the world and our democracy depends upon nurturing and protecting that legal system of which the law schools are such an important part. In a chaotic world, law brings both order and it protects individuals. It brings reason and logic to our social interaction. This is the third building which has housed the law school and I am the third judge to speak 
at a dedication. In January 1897, BU Law dedicated its first facility, the Isaac Rich Hall on Beacon Hill. It invited a Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes, to speak. He chose that celebration to give his famous Path of the Law address. The speech predicted that the path of the law would be what judges said the law would be. But he was a pragmatist, and he recognized the power of law. He agreed that legal reasoning was based on logic, but he warned that the development of law could not be worked out from general axioms like mathematics. The life of the law, he said earlier, was not logic, but experience. He gave an example. He said what motivated bad men to avoid crime was not morality, but nothing more than the avoidance of prison and punishment. His advice to the law school was that this school train lawyers in economic theory and to be better at assessing what he called the social advantage and disadvantage of a particular policy, what we would today call risk-benefit analysis. He did not, let me stress, think economic analysis would ever replace law, and this school has agreed with that proposition. Two things about his speech bear emphasis today. In the entire path of the law, there's only one address to the US Constitution. And that was in the context of avoiding the tendency to equate morality and law. And this is what Justice Holmes said. Confusion of thought can result from assuming that the rights of man in a moral sense are equally rights in the sense of the Constitution and law. Secondly, he made no reference to the Bill of Rights, nor to the use of law for the advancement or protection of personal freedoms. The second dedication was in 1964, when Chief Justice Earl Warren dedicated the new Louis Cert Tower. In contrast to Holmes, Chief Justice Warren referred to the Constitution 18 times. Warren focused, and I'll quote him, on the existence of freedoms which sustain and nurture the human spirit, specifically those embodied in the Bill of Rights. The two justices, like today's justices, had different views of the values embodied in the Constitution. The pre-Civil War Constitution of Holmes' experience was characterized by the inf infamous and wrong Dred Scott Institution case. And when he went on the court, he was a dissenter to the court's holdings on the First Amendment. Perhaps Holmes, thought that the Constitution was not necessarily a progressive document. After all, he had been through the crucible of the Civil War in which the law had failed to be an adequate mechanism of conflict resolution. By contrast, the Warren Court had found in the Constitution and in the post-Civil War amendments many rights especially in the Equal Protection Clause, and it is the court that authored Brown versus Board of Education. Warren spoke of the law as a mechanism for transition of the relationship between individuals and government and for change in our society. What Warren warned against, and I quote again, the problem of adapting our democratic institution to changes which can test the very solidity and durability of our foundations. Again, he, like I, am worried about 
use of the law to protect the basic institutions of our society. Continues to be true. Our task today is certainly no simpler and probably more difficult than it was 50 years ago. The body of what we call the law is much greater now than it was then. And the law school must, as a result, do even more training. Since the 1960s, there's been an explosion of federal and state statutes, and there has been a huge expansion of administrative agencies and law, not to mention the importance of international treaties. With that expansion comes greater complexity and there is increased specialization. Indeed, Sumner Redstone taught entertainment law here. I, I suspect that both Holmes and Warren would be a bit bemused by that, but quite approving of it. Ours is often called a learned profession, and we are so because of our law schools. But the phrase learned profession is incomplete. We are a learned profession in pursuit of justice. And that pursuit of justice is the task of every generation. The present need for the pursuit of justice was so poignantly made recently in Ferguson, Missouri. The peaceful demonstrators there seeking accountability carried signs which had a simple equation. Those signs read, peace equals justice. Think about it. This law school, with its impressive, new, and easy-to-love building, will continue to produce graduates very learned in the law. And I hope that the law students will share the excitement of learning the law and love the law in the pursuit of justice. In closing, let me rely again on Justice Holmes. He said, the practice of law makes good citizens and good men. Of course, I will add, and good women. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be with all of you very good people, good citizens, good practitioners of the law. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Lynch. A project of this magnitude takes not just a village, but a city. We're very grateful to the city of Boston and its support, led for many years by Mayor Thomas Menino and now Mayor Marty Walsh. Mayor Walsh is traveling and couldn't be here today, but I'm happy to welcome in his stead, Dan Coe, Chief of Staff for the Mayor. Thank you, Dean. Thank you so much, Dean. You know, there's really no other place I'd rather be today, and I can prove it to you for two reasons. The first is my boss, Mayor Walsh, is in Ireland right now. And secondly, earlier today, the Boston Globe site went down. So really, I could be doing whatever I want right now. <laughs> so uh, um, it's a real honor that I'm here today. Um, Boston University is near and dear to my heart. Uh, my father was a graduate of the public health school, uh, served many years as a clinician here. Uh, and Mayor Walsh actually had the pleasure of being the keynote speaker at the School of Public Health uh, earlier this year as well. Um, but BU Law really has uh, spurred alumnus uh, from this university, alumni to this, from this university, in so many ways and in so much of public service in the city that we're so grateful for. Uh, Chief Judge, who's already spoken to you today, has given up back so much to our community and we're so grateful for that. Even on the city council, Councilor Flaherty uh, is a Boston University alumnus and he's been a fantastic partner uh, for us. Uh, but when we talk about Sumner Redstone, he's an example of somebody who was an alumnus of this university, built an amazing business, but has really never forgotten about this city. And I think that that's what's so special about all people who are from Boston is that whether you're here in Boston after you graduate or you go somewhere else, Boston stays in your heart. 
And you know, Mr. Redstone was a you know, law lawyer here at Boston University. He had served as chairman of the Jimmy Fund, and he's a member of the Board of Overseers um, of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And when we look at BU Law, so much of what BU Law really preaches is about that giving back. There are low income, uh, there are clinics around low income residents in the city of Boston that is very much a focus of what BU Law students do. There's an immigrants rights clinic that many students go and spend extra time with in, in the city of Boston. And finally, there are so many law clerks that choose to go and serve uh, in the courts after law school to really give back to the city. So, on behalf of Mayor Walsh, I'm very, very grateful for uh, this opportunity to speak to all of you. Very, very grateful to the students of BU and the Dean and the administration for all that you do for the city of Boston. And finally, I wanted to present to the Dean on behalf of the city a, a proclamation of Sumner Redstone Day today, September 19th. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Now I'd like to introduce Rick Godfrey. Rick is a graduate of BU Law, a trustee of Boston University, and the chair of our law school's Building on Excellence campaign. In his spare time, he's also one of the leading litigators in the country. In large part, thanks to Rick's dedication, generosity, and campaign leadership, we're standing here today in this beautiful new building. Please welcome Rick Godfrey. I keep getting thanked for the wonderful work of others. I'm not sure how that works or why I deserve it, but, but thank you for the kind introduction. This is a once in a generation moment in time. I recently reread the dedication address of Justice Holmes, not for preparation of this event, but because I felt a particular client needed to understand the first two paragraphs of that dedication about what the rule of law means in our society. We are thus gathered here today, not just to dedicate a mere building, but we are here to celebrate what this building will stand for, for future generations, in teaching students about the meaning of what the law is, what it should be, and what the rule of law means in our society. We are only here because of the generosity of many people. We have to start, of course, with Mr. Sumner Redstone. Uh, it should go without saying that but for Mr. Redstone's um, generosity, but more importantly, his leadership and his vision, we wouldn't be here at the current time. He led the way, and we thank him for it. But he was not alone. Many others joined him. And it's often true with leadership. One person leads, and not others follow. Many other leaders then emerge. And thus far, and this is a number that somewhat astounds me, we're not even halfway really through our capital campaign. The university asked us to raise $40 million, which they would then initiate the launch on. And as of this morning, we're nearing $45 million just for the law school building itself. That number would have been unthinkable five years ago. In fact, if you'd asked me, I would have taken even odds. We weren't come close to that in this period of time. That's why I like the seven-year concept of the campaign, hoping we could stretch it to eight or nine. <laughs> Sorry, President Brown, but the truth sometimes comes out. But we're also here because of two individuals who uh, never take credit, really, for what they do. And I, I think we should reflect upon this. One is the president of the university, Robert Brown, and the other is Dean O'Rourke. Think of where the university was, and particularly where this law school was, a mere seven or eight years ago. And think of the remarkable changes that have taken place because of their vision and their grand vision for a renewal of this university and of the law school in particular is because of their leadership that all of this is possible. In reflecting, though, upon today, this is, after all, just a building, right? Bricks, mortars, glass, it's a building. And so why, why are all of you here just for a building? Because it's not just a building. This is the place where we will teach future generations about what the law is, what it is not, and what justice in our society is and what it is not. This building has a singular purpose that makes it unique on this campus and among other campuses. 
Its sole purpose in a word is to teach justice, equal access under the rule of law. We talk about American exceptionalism. That, my friends, is it. Equal justice under the rule of law, equal access to the courts of justice. And that's what makes this building special. And that's why all of us have committed ourselves to making this possible. Few ceremonies are so special as this one then. Think of the next time you'll go to a dedication ceremony where the singular purpose is to teach future generations of young lawyers what it is to do right by society and to defend society. That makes this a very special day. Thank you all for coming. It's my privilege to be here. And again, I'm not sure why I'm here. I just was asked to lead this campaign. Um, and I hope I've been able to contribute in some fall, small fashion. But the real leaders are behind me and in front of me. So thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. It was really important to me that you hear from a student so you could hear directly how they feel about the building and how it's changed their experience. Our student speaker is Jackie Rex, a third year here at BU Law. She's been a member of the Civil Litigation Clinic. She participated in BU Stone and Albers Moot Court competitions, winning Best Oralist, Best Brief, and Best Team. It's the trifecta of Moot Court Awards. And I think, I don't know, probably the only other person ever to do that might have been Martha Coakley. So. No pressure, Jackie. Um, she currently serves as editor-in-chief of the Public Interest Law Journal and a judicial extern to the Honorable Nathaniel Gorton, federal district court judge for the District of Massachusetts. Please welcome Jackie Rex. Thank you, Dean O'Rourke, and to everyone once again, welcome to the beautiful Sumner Redstone Building. On behalf of all of the students, I cannot thank you enough for all of your extremely generous contributions, not only to Boston University School of Law, but to all of its students. As a current student, I have the great privilege of providing you with some insight on how your contributions truly have changed student life here at BU Law. Now, without question, the Redstone Building offers incredibly impressive features, all designed with students in mind. For example, McCausland Commons, located just above us on the second floor, offers a beautiful, large dining area that simply did not exist in the tower. Feynman Library offers tremendous new study and workspace. The technology in the classrooms is state of the art and serves only to enhance the already world-class education that we receive from BU's nationally ranked professors. And on top of all of that, students are afforded absolutely stunning views of the Charles River from various locations in and around the building. Now, those are some of the bigger improvements that this new building has to offer, but I can assure you there are plenty of smaller improvements that have not gone unnoticed. For example, this staircase right here um, has put an end to being late to class due to overcrowded elevators. And I know that I speak for all students when I say that we greatly appreciate men and women's bathrooms on every single floor. <laughs> but joking aside, yes, yes, on every floor, we're very, very grateful for that. <laughs> no more hiking between classes. But joking aside, I can tell you that what I appreciate most about the Redstone Building is that the large open spaces and the various seating areas located around the building are promoting a greater exchange of diverse ideas among the student community. In places like Butler Atrium, which we are all enjoying right now, and various lounges in and throughout the facility, students now have a space to communicate, to come together, to have the critical conversations that they've wanted to have, but really have not had the opportunity to do so. This ongoing communication among our students is building a better and stronger community here at BU Law. And as a result, it is contributing to the creation of a better class of lawyers in the future. 
In the three short weeks since the school year began, I can tell you that I have had the pleasure of seeing students taking advantage of the large open dining hall to have lunch with professors. I've seen our upperclassmen offer advice to the 2L and the 1L students, encouraging them to get out into the community, to join the clinics, be they civil litigation, criminal, immigration, what have you. And I've seen students, originally from opposite ends of the country, come together over coffee just to get to know each other. These interactions, this change to the BU law community, that, I believe, is the true beauty of the Redstone Building. I see students listening and learning from each other in ways that I don't think that I have seen before in my tenure here at BU. Our students are being exposed to very different people, very intelligent people, and they are taking that opportunity to push themselves to be better students, to be more socially aware, to be more involved with what happens here at the university and the kind of justice that they want to create in the world. I can tell you that your contributions have played an integral role, not only in ensuring that students benefit from this dynamic community, but that for years to come, this university, this law school, will put better lawyers out into the world. This new facility marks a great change for BU Law. I can tell you that from this point forward, the new lawyers that BU Law puts out into the world will have had the benefit of receiving their education in a community where diverse ideas were encouraged and students' interests truly were put first. So on behalf of the student body, I would like to extend our sincerest gratitude to all who contributed to the design and building of this facility. I am confident that new generations of students will continue to benefit from all that the Redstone Building has to offer. So to all of you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie. Now you see why I'm so proud of our students. Um, so development professionals will say that people give for many reasons and that very often they give to people. And that was certainly the case for my husband, James Malloy, and me. And here I refer not to the soda fountain donation, but, <laughs> but to the one for the staff lounge. It makes a huge difference to me, and I recognize that it's a rare gift to have our university run by someone who has always treated me and the law school respectfully, fairly, generously, and with great kindness. Now, they say that old Yankee Stadium was the house that Ruth built, and new Yankee Stadium is the house that Jeter built. You didn't think I was gonna go through the whole thing without a Yankee <laughs> reference. <laughs> this is the house that Bob built. Please welcome the university president, Dr. Robert A. Brink. Thank you. This is truly a wonderful celebration. And it's an example that sometimes you have to wait a while for something good to happen. Um, <laughs> Judge Lynch and Rick Godfrey did an incredibly eloquent job of telling you the true meaning of this building and the true meaning of the law school both in terms of its place in society, but also its place in the university. I remember that when I came and people were talking about all the different variations on uh, the theme of, of renewing the law campus over the years, about different versions would have moved the law school. And I always thought it was incredibly symbolic that it was at the heart of the campus in the middle of the university, and like it or not, the most visible building on campus, <laughs> right? Now, in, as Maureen knows in those iterations, I pushed and pulled with people from the very beginning to try to keep the law school here. And I want to really thank Lee Cott and the architects and, and the law faculty who worked with us 
who came up with really a marvelous physical solution to the needs for creating the kind of student space and educational space that uh, Jacqueline talked about, and at the same time, solving the architectural problem. And I think it's just totally magnificent. The, when you think about uh, this tower, and you think about the law school, every graduate I have ever met from the law school said one thing to me. The law school tower had issues the first day they saw it. It was not meant for the kind of educational purpose that it was tasked. It was not meant for the kind of student interactions Jacqueline talked about. It was meant to be iconic on the river, which it is. This magnificent new building, and I think the renovation of the tower that's underway, is going to make a huge leap forward in the facilities available to our students and faculty and staff to supply, as Jacqueline said so eloquently, the kind of space necessary to have the human interactions as well as the classroom interactions between students and faculty that make an education, a really quality education. Now, the road to get here, for many people who've been involved, was not straight, it was rather circuitous. It had many twists and turns, and there were a few rock slides that had to be avoided. But without the leadership of Maureen O'Rourke, we would not be here today. Give a round of applause to our dean. Everything she said about the great staff we have and Nancy Joyce and the people who have worked to make all of the logistics of this work really are reflected back on her. I know that Sumner Redstone's magnificent gift was the nucleation point that set off the, the final building of the project, but we would not be here today without all of the contributions and all of the support we've gotten from all of the alumni as part of the Building on Excellence campaign chaired by Rick Godfrey. And with the unabiding support of the law school advisory board, we can now sit in this space. We can walk into the McCausen Commons. We can see the classrooms. And the students can take advantage of this great facility. You have accomplished this together with the university. I'm speaking to the people who have been part of this. And it is emblematic of what a great private university and a great alumni of the law school do together. And I'm really proud of what you've done. Thank you. Um, what I would like you to help me do is take the high bar you've set and translate it to the other schools and colleges at the university because it's an inspiration for everyone. Now, it's interesting as an engineer, when I came to Boston University, it's the first time I actually had been in a university with a law school. Um, and it was not, did not take long to realize that we have a truly great law school. Now I believe we have a law facility that supports the aspirations of that school. It supports the aspirations of our students and the quality, the incredible quality of faculty we have in the school. It's also, and this is not missed on many people, a facility that is visible on the skyline from the river, and I think quite eloquently. It signifies Boston University's continual commitment to be a great private research university, and as ever, in the service of the city, the nation, and the world. We're indebted to all of you for this progress, and I hope everyone comes back time and time again and gets a sense of the accomplishments that have been made because of the commitment to this building. Thank you all for what you've done. So I don't think I ever mentioned the second time that I met Bob. He asked for a tour of the tower because he had heard that there were facilities issues with the law school. 
So he came over and we started in the basement uh, and went on up from there. And when we got done, he said, well, now I see your problem. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm never going to see that guy again. Uh, so, so I'm really glad that I was wrong. All right. Um, so I would ask everyone to, to remain where they are while the stage party joins me for the ribbon cutting ceremony to officially dedicate the building. Also, you'll see the names of our generous supporters on the screens, on the stage, and throughout the building running, and I hope you'll take a minute to look at those. And so again, thank you all really so much for coming, um, for making this happen, and I hope to see many of you, particularly our alumni, tomorrow night at, at reunion. So thanks so much.